Hello and welcome to Weber Book Time. My name is Omar Muhammad. I am the co-author of When Stars Are Scattered with Victoria Jamison. Hello, uh, my name is Victoria Jamison. I'm the co-author of When Stars Are Scattered with Omar Muhammad. And I'm also the illustrator and I made Omar's story into a graphic novel. This book is solely based on my real story, me and my younger brother, Hassan, growing up in a refugee camp, also fleeing from our, our, our country to a refugee camp. First, who is a refugee? A refugee is anyone who leaves, who leaves from their, from their country to another country or even get displaced within their country against their will for fear of persecution. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about how I came to meet Omar and how we collaborate on this project and how I made it into a graphic novel. So I started um, volunteering in my local community with local resettlement agencies. So I was paired with some families who had recently come to the United States and I started hearing some really incredible stories and I wondered if there was a way I could put my background and my skills as a graphic novelist to use um, and maybe bring one of these stories to a wider audience. So I met Omar when I visited his place of work, which is um, Church World Service, which welcomes refugees to the United States and finds them job training and helps um, give them English lessons and that sort of thing. So we met and Omar was working on his adult memoir. I asked if he had ever thought about writing a children's book. And we just sort of sat down to talk about what a collaboration might look like. So me and my younger brother, fled from our country to Kenya and lived in a refugee camp called Dadaab. We lived in that refugee camp for over 15 years. So uh, in the refugee camp, uh, growing up as a child, we didn't enjoy our childhood. Not only me, but all those uh, children who were in that refugee camp. We didn't knew and we didn't have enough toys to play, not leave enough food to eat, enough clothes to wear and uh, even have books to read. So everything was very, very scary. And it was really, really tough. And there's still refugee, refugees who are still in that refugee camp. I, w I went uh, my primary and secondary school in, in, in the Dab refugee camps. Going to school was not easy because I do remember uh, sharing one no uh, notebook with five, six subjects. Some kids even got lost the opportunity to go to school because in high school, the spaces are limited. Every student doesn't get the opportunity to go to high school. Why? Because, for example, in my time, if I, if I guess we were about 800 students and they only had a, a space high school for only 150 students. So 650 students not even continue their studies after middle school, after, after primary school. Majority of the teachers that were teaching in those schools were also refugees themselves. So they were part of the struggle. The three options those refugees have in the refugee camp was uh, for you to go back to your country if it is deemed safe. That was not an option for me. There was still a war in my country. It wasn't safe to go back at that time, still is not safe. The second option, the, the second option was to be resettled to a third country, get the opportunity to be resettled to US, UK, Canada, Australia, all those countries. The third option is do nothing, stay in the refugee camp, die there. The worst, and that was the, and that was the worst thing. Because imagine you were born in a refugee camp, you get married in the refugee camp and you have your kids born in the refugee camp. A whole generation is lost in those refugee camps. Resettlement process, who gets the opportunity to be, to be resettled? All those refugees are vulnerable. Only 1% of those refugees are considered to be resettled. Even less than that 1% makes it to the end. Why? For refugee to be resettled, to come to UK or to come to um, US or to come to go to Canada, they have to be screened, be screened, interviewed, re interviewed again. We were very fortunate that we were, we were one of the vulnerables that were considered 
to be resettled and that that completed all this and then that were able to be resettled to the to, to United States of America. Life in the US is not also easy when you come to a country that everything is different. Food, people, language, weather, housing, everything was different in those in the US. So we struggle in the beginning. But being what we have been through, those refugees, this struggle in abroad is nothing compared to what we have been through. I always think of, when, when I think back, those who, ha who have helped me, including my teachers, my mom, Fatuma, who has, who stand up for me and my younger brother, with anything she could do for us to make sure we are happy. And also, those UN workers, Save the Children, Care International, WFP, those who work with those organizations that go to work day in, day out. They leave their loved ones behind and go to work to help those refugees. We thank you. So one of the first steps when I make a graphic novel, at least with this book, was Omar and I would meet at his offices um, every few weeks and he would tell me some of his life story. And I would take notes, very scattered notes, <laughs> and I would draw pictures. Just kind of learning about his story and hearing his background and what life was like growing up in a refugee camp with his brother. So I did this for a long time where we just talked and kind of put the story together um, in, a, in a graphic novel format. So the next step after I kind of if we had a sense of what the story was going to look like and how we were going to structure it. The next step for me as the graphic novelist was taking the story we had written and then putting it into panel form. So if you've read comics or graphic novels, you know that the pages are broken up into panels. So I had to decide which panels will be big, which one's smaller, and how to really set the pace for the story. So the next step in making a graphic novel is more drawing. If you want to be a graphic novelist, you kind of need to like to draw. Luckily, it's my favorite thing to do, so I love to draw. So this isn't from When Stars Are Scattered. This is on the book I'm currently working on. And this is a page that's about halfway done in rough sketch form. So I start with this blue pencil, and then I go over with darker pencil. And in the final stage, because this isn't ready to be printed in a book yet, it's still pretty sloppy, I still have to do one more set of drawings. And for this set of drawings, I get a bigger sheet of paper and a nicer sheet of paper. So I've got my rough sketch. So this is from When Stars Are Scattered. And I make it bigger. And on the back of the sheet of paper, I scribble all over it with this blue pencil. And then I tape it to my big paper. And then I press down really hard with the pencil and just basically trace it. And that transfers my sketch onto this big sheet of paper. So in this piece, you can kind of see some of that blue line that's underneath. And then I go over it with a pen or a brush to give it that final clean line that has taken months and months and months to get the final clean drawing. So this page, you can see, is not actually perfect. I forgot these characters, this character. So I just drew them in the border and I could put them in in Photoshop afterwards. But I really try and get it as finished as possible before scanning it. So I have to do not so much work on the computer, mostly because I hate working on the computer. The final step, because as you can see, this is black and white and the book is in color, is adding color. So I scan this into the computer and I email it to our colorist. We had a colorist named Iman Getty for this book and she did fantastic color work. So she takes this black and white drawing and kind of colors it in just like a coloring book on the computer using Photoshop, so it's digital color. So the final page of the book looks something like this. So here it is in color, here it is in black and white, and then that's it. You just do it like 250 times and you got yourself a book, no problem. So. Finally, I want to read to you one chapter, chapter one of When Stars Are Scattered. My brother and I live here in a refugee camp in Kenya, in Africa. The camp is called the Dad. We were not born here. Hassan and I were born in Somalia. 
Some people here are from Ethiopia or Sudan or other places in Africa. But we all have one thing in common. We have to leave our homes because we were afraid for our lives. Some people who live here hope they will be sent to America or Canada or some other places to live. Not me though. I just want the war in Somalia to end so we can go back home. Our mom will be able to find us there. The dab is so big. It's actually made up of three separate camps. You can take a bus from one camp to another or you can walk for about four hours. There is Hagadera, which is named after the big tree. There is Degahli, named after I don't know what. I live in Ifo camp, which in English roughly translates to city of light. Don't let the name fool you, though we don't have electricity here. After so many years with so many people living here, Ifo is more like a city than a camp. We have markets, schools, mosques, hospitals, everything refugee camps are supposed to be a temporary place to stay until it is safe to go back home. I guess no one expected the war to last so long though because Hassan and I have been here for seven years. I want to show you how I do one of my drawings because I hear from a lot of people that maybe they'd want to write a book but the one problem is they can't draw. So I am here to tell you that I think everyone can draw. It's just a muscle that you need to strengthen if you want to get better at drawing. I've gotten better at drawing by drawing basically every day for my whole life, just because it's something I like to do. So I'm going to show you how I draw Omar in this book. And I keep my characters very simple because when you write a graphic novel, you have to draw your character a bunch of times. So if you keep them simple, they're easier to draw over and over again. So when I draw Omar, I start with a simple shape, like this, the letter U. And actually when I draw any of my characters, I start this way, because it's just a basic form that you can then customize to make it look like different characters. If you're drawing the entire body of your character, don't fret, it's nothing to worry about. I often will write an upside down letter U for the torso of a character. So if I'm drawing a character doing something, I use a very advanced technique, and this technique is called a stick figure. So I'll draw a stick figure, a leg, another one, whoops, running out of space there, and then some stick arms. And that's how you can start off. So my books are a little more detailed than this. I move kind of a step beyond the stick figure. So one thing I have to do is decide what my character looks like. So I usually draw very simple faces. Eyes can be as simple as that, two dots. For the nose, I often write a backwards letter C and then a smile. And of course you can customize depending on what your character looks like. What does their hair look like? So luckily I had Omar who could tell me what his hair looked like when he was a kid. He didn't have any pictures of himself when he was a child, but he was there to tell me what he looked like, what his brother Hassan looked like. So at least I had that to go with, so I know I wasn't too far off. So on top of this kind of stick figure, then you can add some clothes and some kind of muscles to this stick skeleton you've drawn. Draw some shorts. So on top of the arms, for example, you could just draw another, another line. And it's one step above a stick figure. So I meet a lot of kids who actually tell me they have a hard time drawing hands. So I'm going to show you my secret method for drawing hands. I call it the mitten method. And the first step is I draw a mitten, like so. The next step is inside that mitten, I draw some fingers. And then usually I'm not working in a Sharpie, so then you can erase the kind of the part you don't need to show. So this is a helpful method because it reminds you that your fingers are different lengths and they create kind of a curved shape. So that's an easy way to remember what hands look like. The other method is called the ball and stick method. 
I draw a ball and I draw five sticks. And much like our stick figure person, I then go over it and add some muscles and meat on top of those sticks. So I personally don't have a hard time drawing hands. I like drawing hands, but I do have a very hard time drawing feet. I found it very tricky. And this book was difficult because most of the times the characters aren't wearing shoes. So I had to really learn how to draw feet. So I can say I feel better about drawing feet now. But it's always tricky. I always forget which toe is the big toe. I always kind of mix up the two feet. And this one, I run out of space for that foot. And there you go. So give it a try. Try and draw yourself. Maybe you can draw one of your family members or your friend as a cartoon character and see what you can do. So the very last thing that I want to leave you with is a writing going to say assignment, a writing process. Um, what the heck, let's just say assignment. You're not in school anyway. So if you want to write your own graphic novel, but if you're not sure where to start, this is something I do all the time if I'm stuck for an idea. I take a sheet of paper and the top of the sheet of paper I write two words. I remember dot dot dot. And then I set a timer. So set a timer for two minutes and make a list of all the things that you remember. And it can be anything. It could be, I remember my best birthday party ever. I remember the day I got a puppy. I remember the day that I started first grade. As many things as you can. And then when the timer goes off, pick your favorite memory, maybe one that has really strong emotions, a day that you're really happy or really sad or really excited and see if you can make a short comic about it. If you're not sure how to start that, one way you can start is by drawing a square and drawing three panels within that square. So if I ever get stuck on how to write a story, I split it into three parts, the beginning, the middle, and the end. So take that story that you remember See if you can decide, well, what's the beginning of that story? What's the middle of the story? And what's the big, exciting climax? You can always make it longer or shorter, depending on your story. But if you're stuck, this is a good way to start. And don't forget, you've got all sorts of tools you can use for comics, like speech bubbles and thought bubbles and text boxes, where you can write things like, when I was six years old. So you've got all sorts of great tools to use. And this is why I love making comics because there's so many things you can do when you add pictures and words together. I think it's a really powerful way to tell a story. And I think all of you listening and watching have interesting stories to tell. And the world needs to hear your stories. So I hope that however you want to tell your story, whether it's through writing or drawing or dancing, um, I hope you'll tell your story and share it with the people around you because we really want to hear it. And if you learn one thing or if you take one thing from this book, I'm saying one thing, but there's a million things I want you to take from this book, is no human being wants to be a refugee. And being a refugee is not a choice. You can be a refugee tomorrow. I, I can be a refugee again. Every human being faces some struggle at some time in some way. So think about it. If you are struggling, be patient and try to overcome. Never give up hope. So thank you so much for watching the video and for reading When Stars Are Scattered. Thanks. I hope you enjoyed and thank you for watching and thank you for having me. In a refugee camp, it feels like all you ever do is wait. Wait for food, wait for water, wait for your life to start. My brother Hassan and I live in a refugee camp in Kenya, in Africa. We are here waiting for the war in Somalia to end so we can go back home.
where our mom will be able to find us. In a place as crowded as this, it's easy to feel alone. But I have my brother, I have my school, and I have the community around me. I didn't choose to be a refugee, but I'm choosing to believe in a future for my family.